Welcome to everybody on the webinar. It's Robert Bond here in London. Uh, as we usually do, uh, we're finding that people are logging on right now, and we've got a great number of attendees today. So I'm just going to put us on mute for two or three, two or three more minutes, and then we'll get started. Thank you. So once again, welcome to everybody on the webinar, uh, our Bristow's Legally Speaking, and today is a general data protection update. For those of you who used to attend the webinars that we did at Charles Russell Speechless, you'll remember that every so often we would do a general catch-up as to what we felt were interesting topics, and when we schedule these, we can always be sure that something else will come up that we hadn't thought of. So uh, uh, we could have covered today the rather substantial fine by the Italian Garante. Uh, I could be spending a bit more time talking about Brexit, particularly now that our Queen in the UK has uh, signed off the Brexit bill. But uh, we've got some fixed topics that we're going to come to in a minute. And... Um, if I can just, for those of you that don't know Bristow's, uh, let you read the slide. We've been around for a good number of years. Uh, our reputation seems to give people the impression that we're a very large firm, but in fact we're um, small and perfectly formed, and we cover a wide range of topics, contentious and non-contentious, but we do have uh, a leading data protection practice. Uh, and speakers that are participating today are myself, uh, and many of you will know me, so I don't propose to go through this bio in depth. But I'm also joined by Janine Regan. Again, those of you that followed us at our previous firm will, will know Janine, and the fact that she, like many of the others, uh, deals with cross-border jurisdictional issues in data protection and Janine covers a whole range of sectors that she advises. Alex Dittel is not with us today. He's um, uh, at the last minute uh, had to catch a plane. Uh, so his topic is going to be covered by Emma who I'll introduce in a minute. Uh, Batilde uh, is uh, doing exactly the same work as Janine. Uh, quite a focus on large multinationals and dealing with multi-jurisdictional compliance issues uh, and is focusing, like many of us, substantially on the General Data Protection Regulation or GDPR as everybody's calling it. And then finally, Emma uh, is an associate in the group uh, covering a range of commercial and IT contracts but also uh, working in the area of data protection uh, and she is, as I say, um, for her sins going to have to cover Alex's topics as, as well as her own. And 
talking about topics, we thought we'd look at the Australian privacy law and the changes that are being made there. Um, and Janine is going to cover that. And also, she's going to cover the Information Commissioner's Office, Data Protection Office's annual <coughs> conference, which she attended about a, a week ago. Um, then, uh, woo, who's next? Emma is going to be looking at the recent subject access request law in the UK. Uh, I'm going to look at privacy considerations and ethics in machine learning, cognitive computing, artificial intelligence, etc. And then Batilde is going to look at GDPR guidance and what have we got so far and what do we expect to come from the regulators. And then finally Emma is going to look at um, the code of conduct for cloud infrastructure service providers. And remember that you can send your questions in at any time. Uh, which we'll either take then or we can park those until the end of the presentation. Uh, and we hope that you enjoy this. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Janine. Thank you, Robert. Okay, um, so historically, breach notification has been a feature predominantly of the US legal system. But with increasing cyber attacks, many other countries around the world have, of recent years, been following suit. The EU General Data Protection Regulation, for example, um, will introduce mandatory breach notification rules across the EU from May 2018. And in fact, some countries just can't even wait for the GDPR and the Netherlands, for example, decided that it would actually introduce its own law regarding breach notification sooner. It was that excited around get, about getting this into force. So what's the current position in Australia? Well, in Australia, currently, the breach notification scheme that they have is actually quite similar to what we have here in the UK. This means that there's no general mandatory obligation in most circumstances to notify the commissioner but where there are serious breaches you are expected to voluntarily notify the um, authorities of the incident. However um, this is all going to change in Australia soon and there will be obligations to notify the Australian Privacy Commissioner as well as the affected individuals where there is a real risk of serious harm to individuals. This is sounding very uh, familiar when we think about the GDPR requirements as well. One of the differences though is that in Australia they don't specify a time period for which you need to notify the Commissioner or the affected individuals but they say this needs to be as soon as practicable. Now, the Commissioner is very keen that minor breaches are not reported to its office or to, the, or to the affected individuals. And they explicitly talk about the example of, that we've all done at some point, I'm sure not me, of course, or anyone who says, but they're inadvertently sending an email um, to the wrong recipient. They say that they don't want those types of minor breaches to be reported at the risk of... Um, notification fatigue. This is where you receive so many notifications that you just don't take them seriously anymore. In terms of the information that you will be required to provide to the Commissioner in the notification form, well the requirements are very similar to that under GDPR. So you will have to talk about the nature of the breach, the number of affected records, the nature of the data, the impact that you see the breach having, the various actions that you've taken, to mitigate the consequences and so forth. Now in terms of when this new amendment might be enforced, well, it was going to come into force one year after Royal Assent and Royal Assent should um, be pretty um, soon actually. So perhaps we're looking uh, at this coming into force as around the same time as GDPR. And therefore, I've you know, drawn lots of parallels with GDPR here, and I think really the key takeaway is that if you have a breach that is impacting in Australia, 
and in Europe, then you're probably going to have to make notifications in both of those jurisdictions. Okay, so moving on now to the ICO DPO annual conference. So I wanted to give you uh, a brief update on the discussions at this conference that I attended on the 6th of March. It was actually the first conference of the, which was uh, headed by the new commissioner, Elizabeth uh, Denham, and she was very impressive indeed. Now, as you would expect, GDPR and Brexit were high on the agenda of the conference and the Commissioner said that GDPR is really a once in a generation opportunity to create data confidence in the UK. Data confidence was a real buzzword of the conference. Everybody was talking about how important that is. Um, she said that this will likely remain the core of UK law as it is necessary for the digital economy. However, there was a recognition during the conference that the UK will, or the ICO, will lose its influence in European circles. And there was an emphasis, therefore, that the ICO is really going to step up its international engagement. In particular, it's going to increase its influence in the Asia-Pacific, where there are lots of developing, lots of emerging data protection laws. It is going to have deeper links with the Commonwealth, which is via an organization called the Common Thread Network. It's also going to work more to develop industry standards, so it's going to be working with ISO and W3C and the likes. And it's also, this is a big focus for the ICO generally, so it's going to engage a lot more with think tanks and academics, particularly through its research and grants program. However, the ICA did say that it would like to have a formal relationship with the European Data Protection Board and that it hoped that this relationship would be constructive and mutually supportive. And it also said that it will seek to strengthen its relationship with the Council of Europe. And the Council of Europe is not a European Union institution. Now, in terms of a couple of other notes that I found um, pretty interesting from the conference. Um, obviously, there are lots of data protection officers at the conference, so there are lots of questions around the role of the DPO. And the ICA said that actually it's going to be publishing its own guidance note on DPOs under GDPR in the next six months. So we'll, of course, keep you updated when we receive that guidance, and we'll let you know our thoughts. The ICO is also very keen to include its technical knowledge around technology. This is a high area of priority, the ICO said, and they're going to be advertising soon for a chief technology strategist, and also they're, they're going to be advertising soon as well for a general counsel, which is pretty interesting too. They've never had a general counsel before, though they have a very good legal team. Now, in terms of funding, as you may know, um, under GDPR, registrations or notifications are going to be abolished. And it's through these notification fees, actually, that the ICO receives the majority of the funding. So the question that many people have been asking, well, what on earth are you going to do? How are you going to pay for these wages? The commissioner said that she was confident that she's going to receive adequate funding once GDPR is in force and notification these have been abolished and she's already proposed a budget taking into account the ICO's new responsibilities under GDPR and I read, uh, I think it was just yesterday or the day before, that actually she would like to hire 200 additional employees so if anybody fancies a new job, the <laughs> ICO is clearly going to be hiring in Wimslow, um, which is a very nice area, that's where I'm from. Um, so I think it's very interesting with the, um, the substantial increase in staff that the ICO feels it needs in order to um, take account of its new responsibilities under GDPR. Okay. Thank you, Judy. Uh, Emma. Oh, thanks, Judy. Right, so um, I'm going to cover some recent cases um, dealing with the right of subject access 
So this first slide um, it just sets out the key provisions of the Data Protection Act 1988, which was the legislation at the heart of these cases. And the provisions that I've listed here are the ones that are at the centre of debate. The slide self-explanatory, and I'll just run through it very quickly. So you have Section 7, and this provides individuals with the right of access to their personal data, which they can exercise by making a subject access request. Section 7.9 provides that if a court is satisfied that the data controller has failed to comply, they can order them to comply. Section 8.2 requires a copy of the personal data to be provided unless this is not possible or would involve disproportionate effort. Finally, paragraph 10 of Schedule 7 provides that personal data is exempt from the right of subject access if legal professional privilege can be maintained in legal proceedings in respect of that information. And I'll refer to this throughout as the LPP exemption. So on to the first case. Um, this was a case in the High Court, um, Hollyoak and Candy. The background to this case is that Mr Hollyoak and Mr Candy were involved in a dispute in the High Court relating to a loan agreement and there was another party to litigation called CPC which was a company registered in Guernsey. So Mr Hollyoke made an access request to Mr Candy and CPC in the context of this litigation. They responded and claimed LPP in respect of some documents. Mr Hollyoke then applied to the High Court, ordering them to, seeking, seeking the compliance to be ordered in relation to his subject access request. Essentially he wanted more documents for the purposes of this litigation. So there are three key issues which I want to cover for this case. Firstly, the extent to which a data controller is obliged to search for documents in order to comply with an access request. So here, the court said that there was an implied obligation to carry out a reasonable and proportionate search. And this limitation was imposed by Section 8.2 of the DPA, or by the principle of proportionality, which is a fundamental principle of EU law and therefore must be applied in construing national legislation implementing the directive. The second issue was whether CPC, the company, should have searched private email accounts in order to comply with Mr Hollyoke's request. Mr Hollyoke clearly asserted it should have done. Crucially, in this case, there was actually no evidence that the company's directors had used their private email accounts for company business. The court, therefore, did not accept Mr Hollyoke's argument. It did state, however, that if a company director uses a personal email account for corporate business, then he may owe the company a duty to allow access to his private email to enable them to comply with the subject access request. However, the company is not required to ask this question in the first instance unless there is a sufficient reason to do so, which there wasn't here. Finally, the court had to determine whether LPP could have still apply where a document or communication was the result of fraudulent or criminal activity. This is the so-called iniquity exception, and in this instance it's an exception to an exception. Mr Hollyoke had argued that LPP could not be relied on because the documents were tainted by criminal conduct. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the court confirmed it would not uphold LPP if there was a strong prima facie case of wrongdoing. However, in this case, there wasn't sufficient evidence, and as a speculative case, there might be iniquity, would not displace LPP. And so, moving on to the second case, and this is Dawson Damer um, against Taylor Wessing, and this was quite a recent case in the Court of Appeal. Judgment was handed down on the 16th of February 2017. So, this case, obviously, again, related to an access request, um, in this case, which was submitted by beneficiaries of a trust which was based in the Bahamas, to the solicitor's firm, Taylor Wessing. Taylor Wessing's client was a Balmain trustee company, which was currently in a dispute, lit lit litigious dispute, with the beneficiaries in the Bahamas. Now, for reasons that will become clear later, it is relevant here that under Balmain law, the beneficiaries cannot compel trustees to disclose trust documents. In response to the beneficiaries' request to Taylor Wessing, they responded claiming LPP exemption under paragraph 10 of Schedule 7 of the DPA because the trustee company was their client. Now, they applied this as a blanket exemption and stated that it covered all the information. In fact, there was no evidence to suggest they even tried to search for documents. The beneficiaries then asked the High Court to compel compliance under Section 7.9 of the DPA, 
Taylor Ratting was successful in the High Court. However, the Court of Appeal overturned this decision. So why was this different conclusion reached? The first question before the Court related to the extent of the LPP exemption under the DPA. In particular, whether LPP within the DPA covered documents which could not be disclosed to the beneficiaries under Barmaian Trust Law. And they refer to this as the wide view. Or whether the LPP exemption merely applied to documents which attached legal professional privilege under English law, the narrow view. The Court of Appeal adopted the narrow view, and they held that the LPP exemption relieves the data controller from complying with an access request only if there is privilege according to the law of any part of the United Kingdom. It does not apply if the privilege attaches as a result of foreign law, in this case, Barmaian law. So the second issue to be determined, again related to the disproportionate effort test, specifically whether this applied only to the supply of the information or whether it also applied to the search, of those, search for those documents. Now it's worth noting here that the ICO's subject access code of practice favours the supply approach. If the disproportionate effort in supplying the document, that's the issue, not disproportionate effort in searching for that document. Well, the Court of Appeal held that the disproportionate effort test includes difficulties in the process of complying with the request, and therefore a data controller should apply proportionality to all stages of the process of compliance, including the search. In this case, Taylor Wessing had taken had adduced no evidence to show they take any steps to comply. And this was clearly held to not meet the threshold. The final key issue was whether the court could compel compliance with the access request where the individual's motive was to use the information in legal proceedings in the Bahamas. The Court of Appeal was quite clear on this point and held there was no other purpose rule, which is an automatic bar to the court ordering a data controller to comply with an access request under Section 7.9. For those of you who are familiar with the Durant ruling, this may seem at odds with the court's decision there. And the Court of Appeal pointed out in this case that the judge's comments in Durant were made in the context where the individual sought to use the access request to obtain personal data of a third party, whereas, whereas in this case, the intention was to obtain the individual's own personal data. And finally, the Court of Appeal heard these two cases together and judgment was handed down just two weeks ago. So there's a lot of information on the slide here and the main point I want to focus on is the final one. Just a bit of background, the first case related to a dispute in a tenant and his tenant management company and the second was um, an, set against the backdrop of eight years employment litigation. In both cases the individuals had made access requests and there had been partial compliance but then they both gone to court compelling further compliance. So to take the final point five, which is interesting because the court listed some of the factors that could be taken into account when exercising discretion under 7.9. And these included whether it was more appropriate, whether there was a more appropriate route to obtaining the information, for instance, disclosure in litigation, in litigation, the nature and gravity of the data controller's breach, the reason for the access request, and they actually stated that the absence of a legitimate reason has a bearing on the exercise of their discretion. And so, how do we draw all this together? Well, I think from the um, information that I've just mentioned, I expect the role of a data subject's motive would continue to play a role in subject access rights disputes. While there's an automatic bar where the intention is to use the information for litigation, the final case does illustrate there are factors the court will take into account when exercising discretion which do relate to motive. Also of particular interest is that in this case the Court of Appeal confirmed a 25% a 25 reduction in the costs awarded to Dr. Deere in respect of her initial successful application to the court due to her, and I quote, an essentially antagonistic attitude and low level attritional warfare against the university. The GDPR GDPR enhanced the rights of indig individuals, timing the procedure for complying with subject access requests and introducing new rights. We are likely to see, therefore, more instances of individuals asserting their rights and disputing the extent to which data controllers have complied with these. Thank you, Emma. And um, <clears throat> moving on to uh, privacy considerations in artificial intelligence. Well. What prompted me to think about focusing on this for a few minutes was that uh, 
I got invited about 10 days ago to go before a uh, group of European uh, MEPs uh, because there has been a paper produced uh, by the Parliament Legal Affairs Committee calling for EU-wide rules on robotics. And really what's driving some of the MEPs to focus on this area is in part issues around employment, that there is a fear that humans will lose employment because menial and not so menial tasks will be undertaken by machines. There's also a concern that cognitive computing or artificial intelligence or machine learning uh, may produce um, discriminatory outcomes um, on the basis of rubbish in, rubbish out. Uh, and so the, the hearing, although it was more of a debate, was um, uh, between one of the major um, vendors in the AI space uh, and myself with MPs, MEPs around the table. Um, and it also coincided with a report by the Alan Turing Institute in London together with the University of Oxford that suggested that there's a need for the creation of an AI watchdog to act as an independent third party that can intervene where automated decisions create discrimination. Uh, this report from the Turing Institute indicates that where there's no human intervention in an outcome based on algorithmic-driven automated decisions, then the results may be flawed and discriminatory because, for example, the data samples are too small or based upon incorrect or incomplete assumptions or statistics. In other words, as I said a few minutes ago, um, rubbish in, rubbish out still continues to apply. The technology is not of itself the problem, but it's the parameters of the analysis that are applied to the input data that can create the anomalies and discrimination. Now, having said all of that, what I also said to the MEPs was that we shouldn't fear new technology. Uh, it's inevitable that there will be technology replacing certain human uh, activities. We shouldn't, uh, we, we're adopting connected autonomous vehicles at a fast rate and actually suggesting that they may be good for reducing accidents, they may be good for enabling elderly people to get around because they will be uh, in driverless cars. But it wasn't that many years ago, another, a century or so ago, that the car was, was seen as likely to scare horse-drawn carriages, run over children, and therefore every car was made to have a man with a red flag in front of it. We can't simply take that approach with the new technology. But leaving aside the questions of the MEPs and this report from the Turing Institute as to whether or not there needs to be a, a watchdog, uh, there is a right under the current data protection directive and indeed its interpretation in each member state giving individuals an ability, up to, an ability to understand the methodology behind the automated decision making or profiling or big data analytics uh, or AI. Uh, Section 12 in the Data Protection Act gives individuals the right to understand the methodology now. And of course we know that GDPR specifically deals with automated decision making in Article 22. Although it is a limited right in that an individual can only object where the algorithm or the machine decision uh, impacts adversely the rights of the individual. 
However, GDPR does, on those that use AI, place strict obligations to put in place security by design, privacy by default to protect humans and the privacy of individuals. And where artificial intelligence is processing sensitive data like biometrics or religious and philosophical beliefs or health data or criminal records, then more express consent needs to be obtained for those activities. And yet the challenge with AI is that it may be impractical or defeat the growth of the digital economy to constantly have to ask individuals to say yes or say no. Indeed, big data analytics uh, can produce extremely good humanitarian outcomes uh, where there isn't necessarily human input at all. Uh, for those of you that have tuned into our webinars in the past, you've heard me talk about the work that I'm involved in with the United Nations in the privacy group there, where the UN are using location data on mobile phones to identify where migration is taking place from, say, Syria, and to work out which border they need to move the tent to or move the food to. So the societal or humanitarian outcome is a good thing that outweighs the idea of getting consent from those migrants to be tracking them. So I think there are many, many good and positive things that can be done with algorithms, with analytics, with AI, whatever you call it, with robotics. But I do agree, not that there should be a, a new regulator or a watchdog, but I do agree that businesses that invest in this uh, should approach their compliance with the law as more of a compliance with ethics and trust. And one of the things that we, we heard uh, in European Parliament from one of the chief evangelists for uh, IBM uh, Watson was that they have a very strict code of ethics that their scientists apply when they are inputting data and when they are assessing outcomes. So I think business needs to help itself and it doesn't surprise me uh, that we are seeing the likes of the users of those big AI processes, processes helping themselves by producing codes not of legal compliance but of ethics. I think without that um, humans may mistrust what is happening with their data and we may then find that the politicians and the bureaucrats, let alone the regulators, jump in sometimes where they're not quite needed and stifle innovation and digital business. But we do need decent policies and again the uh, Tech UK has got a big data governance committee which is looking at the legal and ethical approaches to AI and big data analytics which I chair and maybe we'll come back and look at this as a separate topic uh, in the future. Uh, having said all of that, when it comes to relying solely on machine learning, uh, the answer for humans is just because you can doesn't necessarily mean you should. With that, I'll hand over to Batil. Thank you, Robert. Okay, so today, let's, sorry. I'm, gonna, I'm going to talk about um, the guidance that has been issued by the Article 29 Working Party, which is the body composed of data protection authorities from each EU member state. And more specifically, this guidance is going to be about um, the General data, data Protection Regulation, which we know as the GDPR. Now, as we all know, the date where the GDPR becomes effective is fast approaching. And so organizations which are currently preparing for the GDPR are trying to interpret what the GDPR precisely requires. 
This is why the guidance from the Article 29 Working Party is very much welcome because it provides details on the level of compliance that EU regulators are expecting. Now, first, oops, yeah, let's have a look at um, what has been done so far. So, last December, the Article 29 Working Party has issued guidelines and FAQs on three topics of the GDPR. The right to data portability, the obligation for controllers and processors to appoint a data protection officers, and how to identify a lead supervisory authority in the context of the one-stop shop. Now, we don't have time to enter into the details of each guidelines during this webinar, but what I'm going to do is to highlight the key points to remember for each topic. So, let's start with the right to data portability. So, first, it's a new right, which is created by the GDPR in its Article 20. And when it comes to defining this right, the guidelines state that it basically involves two things. First, it's a right for individuals to receive their data back from a data controller and to retain it. And secondly, it's also the right for um, individuals to transfer their data to another service provider if they choose to do so. So in the guidance, we learn that the objectives of this new right are essentially to give data subjects more control over their personal data and to facilitate switching from one service provider to another in an easy and safe manner. So the right to data portability must be implemented in a way that supports this objective, the Article 29 um, Working Party says. So one thing that I find particularly helpful in these guidelines is that they clarify the scope of this right. They start by making it clear that the GDPR does not establish a general right of data portability. So it only applies under certain conditions. The first condition is that the legal, the legal basis of the processing must be either the data subject's consent or the necessity to perform a contract. So this means that if another legal ground for processing is relied upon, for instance, the legitimate interest of the data controller, the right to data portability would not be available. Another condition, which is set out in the GDPR, is that this right only applies to personal data which is provided by the data subject. And the Article 29 Working Party says that this should be interpreted broadly and should include not only data actively provided by an individual, but also the data generated by the activity of this individual, or which results from the observation of his behavior. But in no, in no instance should this right include the subsequent analysis of this behavior by the controller. So let's take an example. For instance, a fitness application that a user downloads on his mobile device. So the data that would fall within the scope of the right to data portability would include first the data submitted by the user when registering with the app, so basic information such as his name, his date of birth, etc. And second, it would also include the raw data collected by the app. For instance, the geolocation data, heartbeats, etc. But it would not cover any information derived or inferred from the raw data. In other words, any conclusion about the user's general state of health or performance would not be regarded as portable data. Another interesting aspect of the guidelines is that they explain how the right to data portability relates to other individual rights. So on this point, the guidelines confirm that the right to data portability does not affect a data subject's ability to exercise, to exercise his other rights. For, for example, it does not automatically trigger the deletion of data from a controller system, and it should not stop a data subject from continuing to use and benefit from the services provided by the data controller. Perhaps one key element of the guidelines is that they recommend best practice and tools that, could, that can be used by data controllers to comply with the right to data portability. In fact, the guidelines even anticipate that data controllers will need to implement various tools and processes to facilitate this right. So for instance, they suggest that implementing processes for ascertaining the, the identity of the data subjects 
and to respond to requests without undue delay would be best practice. In terms of how to answer the request, they suggest allowing individuals to download their personal data directly from the controller's website or directly transmitting the data to another controller, for instance, by providing an application programming interface. So basically, the, guideline, the guidelines include a lot more details that are useful to understand how the right to data portability applies. So I very much encourage you to read them if your business is likely to be impacted by this right. Now, let's have a look at the guidelines on data protection officers, which we usually call DPOs. As a quick refresher, the GDPR says that organizations must appoint a DPO in certain circumstances which are set out in a GDPR. So on this point, the guidelines are very helpful because they clarify the criteria and the terminology used in the GDPR. They also provide concrete examples of situations where a DPO is likely to be needed and where it is not. Now, if your business does not meet the criteria for which a DPO is mandatory, the Article 29 Working Party says that it is still good practice to appoint a DPO anyway. Now, I personally agree with this point because having a data protection expert in your organization is certainly going to be helpful to comply with the GDPR. GDPR. Having said that, one thing you should think about is the title of this data protection expert. And this is because the Article 29 Working Party explains that if you call this person a DPO, even if this person is appointed voluntarily, the GDPR requirements for DPO will apply to your organization as if its designation was mandatory. And because some of these requirements are quite prescriptive, you may want to consider having someone effectively performing this function, but with a different name. Okay, so let's assume you need or want to appoint a DPO. Now, the next question is, which DPO should you appoint? The GDPR says that the DPO should be easily accessible. The guidelines explain that this means the DPO must be able to communicate in a language that data subjects and DPAs are likely to speak. In practice, this means that this may make it more difficult to appoint one centralized DPO for a group of companies. So if you are a multinational group, either you are able to find DPOs who are multilinguists, or you may want to consider having a DPO team as opposed to a single person. One last point about DPOs. The GDPR says that the DPO's tasks must not result in a conflict of interest. In its guidelines, the Article 29 Working Party has clarified that senior management positions such as CEO, COO, CFO, Head of HR, Marketing or IT will, as a rule of thumb, be positions that necessarily conflict with the role of the DPO. And this is because the key criteria is that a DPO cannot hold a position which leads him to determine the purposes and the means of processing personal data. Now, finally, let's have a quick overview of the guidelines on lead supervisory authority. The need to determine a lead supervisory authority is based on a one-stop shop mechanism under the GDPR. The one-stop shop mechanism means that organizations which carry out cross-border processing across the EU should not have to deal with multiple regulators in each EU member state, but rather with one lead authority which has primary responsibility for investigating the processing. So what do the guidelines say? First, they explain in details how to determine the lead supervisory authority for controllers. The GDPR says that it will, be the it will be the place of a controller's single or main establishment. However, in practice, this is quite tricky and it will not always be straightforward. So the guidelines provide criteria on how to identify the main establishment. One key point here is that the guidelines confirm that there can be situations where there are more than one lead of supervisory authorities. And this is the case, for instance, where a controller has separate decision centers in different EU countries and for different processing activities. 
Another point that the guidelines emphasize is that the main establishment is a question of facts. So artificial choices, which do not really reflect the reality, are likely to be challenged by regulators. And ultimately, the burden of proof is on the organization, which should be able to back up its choice of main establishments. The guidelines also clarify the scope of the one-stop shop mechanism. First, it does not only apply to lo no, sorry, it does not apply to local data protection activities, because in this case, each local data protection authority will be competent on a local basis. Second, the one-stop shop mechanism is not available for organizations which do not have any establishment in the EU. In this case, non-EU-based controllers must deal with local data protection authorities in each member state which they target. Finally, the guidelines explain that in cases where both an EU-based data controller and a processor have a lead supervisory authority, the competent lead supervisory authority should be that of the controller. So that's it for the lead supervisory authority. Now, so now that the Article 29 Working Party has issued its guideline, what's next for 2017? In January of this year, the Article 29 Working Party has released its GDPR Action Plan for 2017. A couple of points are worth mentioning. First, it indicates that it will, if necessary, update the guidelines it has issued following a review of stakeholders' comments on these documents. It also says that the Article 29 Working Party it intends to finalize its work on topics initiated in 2016, and particularly guidelines on certification, high-risk processing and data protection impact assessment, administrative fines, and how to set up the European Data Protection Board. And in terms of new priorities for 2017, the Article 29 Working Party intends to produce guidance on the topics of consent and profiling, transparency, and it will also update its existing opinions on data transfers to third countries and data breach notification. There will also be two workshops, one in April and one in May, where interested stakeholders will be invited to present their views and comments on various topics. Emma, over um, to you again on cloud <laughs> infrastructure codes. On behalf of Alex, so the Cloud Infrastructure Services Providers in Europe, or CISPE, as it is otherwise known, which is a relatively new coalition of more than 20 cloud infrastructure providers operating in Europe, has issued its own data protection code of conduct for cloud infrastructure service providers. And I'll refer to it throughout this presentation as a code for ease of reference. By way of background, the Cloud Infrastructure Service Providers is a private association and its members include Amazon Web Services, Aruba, Least Web, Outscale, OVH, Solidhost and UpCloud, to name but a few. So the code aligns with the strict requirements laid out in the GDPR. The intention of the code is to help cloud infrastructure providers comply with GDPR and therefore avoid penalties while simultaneously offering a framework to help customers and end users select their cloud providers and trust the services that they are being offered. In particular, the purpose of the code is to boost confidence in cloud services on the part of SMEs, small, medium-sized businesses. The, cloud, sorry, the code only applies in a business-to-business -business context and it focuses on cloud infrastructure service providers' obligations as data processors. And this is unsurprising, really, as by its very nature, infrastructure as a service is primarily under the customer's control. They decide how they use the service and what content they upload, and are therefore data controllers. The code does not apply to any data processed by the cloud providers as controllers, therefore such as account information and billing data. In addition, the, cloud ex sorry, the code explains how cloud providers can support their customers who are either data controllers or themselves data processors in the supply chain. So moving on to the next slide. <clears throat> 
and its status at the moment is that it has not been submitted for approval by the Article 29 Working Party. However, it does seem to address, this code seems to address most of the concerns that were raised by the Working Party in relation to another industry-wide code produced previously. That is namely the code produced by the Cloud Select Industry Group on Code Conduct. And this code was twice rejected for want of a better term by the Article 29 Working Party, who then made suggestions on how it could be improved. And commentators have noted that this code actually provides clearer and more clearer guidance and more value than that of the Cloud Select Industry Group. So the question arises, what is the code's legal status? Well, it is a voluntary instrument. Its aim is to facilitate trust between cloud infrastructure providers and their customers. Unfortunately, adherence to the code will not guarantee a cloud providers or a customer's compliance with applicable law. Customers will therefore be encouraged to complete their own assessment of their processing activities and should confirm themselves whether they are complying with EU data protection law. They cannot rely solely on the certification under the code. The question then arises, what is the mechanism for becoming certified? Well, cloud providers can choose to be certified by submitting a declaration of adherence, which can then be supported by an independent third party who will assess the level of their compliance, or the cloud provider can carry out a self-assessment. Compliance marks which the provider may use to demonstrate their adherence to the code to their customers will differ depending on the type of certification they have carried out. Those undergoing certification should enjoy a more esteemed status than those who just self-assess. As a practical point, cloud infrastructure providers will need to ensure that any agreements with new customers do not contradict the code requirements, and ideally this should be done before they declare their adherence to the code. Therefore, we come on to the content of the code. The specific requirements of the code are, well, the headline points are listed out on this slide, and I'll run through the key bullets, the key points on this slide, and provide a short summary of the specific requirements for each one. Just as a general point to start, the code gives a very good overview of issues that should be considered in every data processing agreement or included in the data protection clause of a service agreement, where the customer is controller and the service provider is a processor. So, firstly, there must be a written contract between the parties which contains prescribed content as is required under the GDPR. The contract should state, for example, that the cloud provider may only process personal data on the documented instructions of the customer. It is suggested in the code that the description of processing in the service agreement should be sufficiently broad to allow for flexibility in the customer's use of the service. Secondly, on transfers of personal data, the cloud provider must disclose to the customer at least general information about their server locations and at least enough information for the customer to determine the appropriate jurisdiction. For security reasons, the code recognises the exact addresses of server locations may not need to be disclosed to the customer, but they should be communicated to the data protection authority if requested. The cloud provider should guarantee to the customer that customer data will not be transferred out of the EEA. If the customer so chooses, and they will, therefore, they will be allowed to pick, data pick their data locations, which could be outside the EEA, as long as there is an appropriate transfer mechanism in place. This data localization obligation has actually been criticised for going against the spirit of the GDPR. But the fact that GDPR is not yet in effect means that when it does come into effect, it will allow for codes to serve as a lawful data transfer mechanism where data is being transferred to a third country. So perhaps this is actually an early indication that the code may be revised when GDPR comes into effect in order to enable international data transfers. Until that point, however, where the customer chooses non-EEA locations, they will have to put in place either standard contractual clauses BCLs, the EU, US Privacy Shield, or other recognised compliance standards. And then on to sub-processing. The code states that a cloud infrastructure provider must, um, sorry, 
must not engage a sub-processor without specific or general written permission. Where a general permission is given in the service agreement, the cloud provider must give the customer the opportunity to object to each new sub-processor. The cloud infrastructure provider must also maintain an up-to-date list of sub-processors and make this access accessible to the customer. They must also implement operational arrangements in respect of their sub-processors to provide an equivalent level of data protection and provide documentary evidence of such arrangements to the customer. Now, the code recognizes that it is important for the cloud infrastructure provider to demonstrate their compliance to the customer, and therefore they must provide sufficient non-confidential and confidential information about the security controls that they have in place in order that the customer can verify that their security obligations are being met. Now, the audit provisions of the code are particularly, particularly interesting because they provide that cloud providers do not have to permit customers the right to physically audit their server locations. They recognize that there are security risks associated with this. Instead, audits can be carried out by an independent third party, and the customer can share the audit report with the Data Protection Authority, if required, to demonstrate they are complying with their obligations as a data controller. And so I'll move on to the data breaches. And to assist with this obligation, the cloud provider will have to put in place a security incident management policy to enable it to comply with the requirement to notify data breaches to customers. Notifications, crucially in this case, include all the GDPR prescribed content. The deletion and return of personal data separates the obligations such that it is the customer's responsibility to manage deletion and retrieval of data, not the cloud providers. The cloud provider should only have to provide the functionality for the customer to delete or return any personal data at the end of the service agreement, or allow the customer to deploy its own solution to do this. And finally, security. The code helpfully defines the split of responsibilities in relation to security between the cloud provider and the customer. The code explains, for example, that the cloud provider is not solely responsible for customer deployed operating systems and applications hosted on the service. These are the responsibility of the customer. Whilst the cloud provider will provide a solid security framework, the customer will remain responsible for assessing that framework and making sure it is appropriate for its purposes. And the customer should also have, also have its own capability to check whether security is adequate. And finally, just to um, wrap this up, how will the cloud provider's compliance with the code be monitored? Well, the compliance of the code will be monitored and enforced through the complaints committee. In the case of non-compliance, the provider could be asked to carry out specific remediating measures within a reasonable time frame. In extreme or repeated cases of non-compliance, the committee may suspend or revoke the member's declaration of adherence. Finally, just to again mention the impact of the GDPR, revisions of the code are to be expected as further guidance on the GDPR is issued. As I've already said, under GDPR, there will be the possibility to use codes approved by a supervisory authority as a means of providing appropriate safeguards for transferring personal data to third countries. This means the code may be amended to serve as a mechanism for international transfers under the GDPR. Thank you, Emma. So, I think that the code of conduct makes for interesting reading if you are a controller that wants to give some thought as to what a competent cloud provider would be expected or prepared to represent and warrant. And I think it is a very good move by the, by the participants in it. And I think it will be a forerunner for quite a lot of other codes of conduct and certifications that we'll see when GDPR comes into effect. Uh, we obviously heard from Batilde about some of the guidance that's out there, uh, and I know um, Batilde talked about the role of the DPO. Um, and with that in mind, I was going to let you know that we've got a webinar on April the 20th where we have got three current DPOs from different industry sectors who are going to be talking with me and one of our associates, Hannah, around what is the role of the DPO. So we'll do a deeper dive into some of the things that Batil mentioned there.
had come up under the guidance from Article 29 on what do you call this person and how do you manage the power that a formal DPO will have. Closer to home on March the 30th, we are hosting a webinar with the Data Protection Network looking at charities and fundraisers and the role of data protection, particularly in the light of the uh, Information Commissioner's focus over the past few months on charities and fundraising. And for those of you who, uh, ha who want to download a recording and for those that are not able to attend, we will be having uh, a recording available from our website within the next week. So from me, Robert, on your behalf, thank you to Batilde and to Emma and Janine for their contributions. And we look forward to being with you on another occasion. Thank you. Bye-bye.